that's what stirred the high school transition because my wife would pretty much come home every day and just be like, we don't have, we don't have a family. You? Like, when am I going to see you? Yeah. You know, like, I'm having a blast. Yeah. We're like playing Georgetown, <laughs> yeah. and, like sleeping in right. a king size bed, yeah. eating steak. Like, you know, <laughs> this there was, is tight. Welcome to Coach Him Up. I'm joined. I'm Tim. I'm joined here. Uh, that's who I am. I'm Tim. Uh, this is Zach. I'm Zach. Hi, Zach. Um, we're joined today by Richard Burnett. Rich, you prefer? Do you prefer Rich or Richard? You know, um, I like Richard. You know, Richard, I just, I've been rich for so long. Like yes. just college strength conditioning. It was a baseball coach who was just like, "You're rich," and I'm like, "All right." You know, it's just because convenient for him to say. My wife still calls me Richie. But you know, Richard. Let's let's bring it's Richard. Defined. Back, you know what I'm saying? It, it, defined. Yeah, I like it. Richard. You, you sound like a man of culture. It's like I like calling yeah, you Timothy Richard. and you Zachary. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just like let's just we'll keep get back that to going for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me just start all that over. In the I'm weight Timothy. Room, this is Zachary, yeah. <laughs> and we're joined here by Richard. <laughs> hey man, we got options. Um, all right, so uh, we know who you are. Maybe not everybody knows listening who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us just like you know your background, where you're from? How'd you got here with, uh, sure. with us today? Yeah, I'm I'm a strength coach, and this is my 15th year. It's crazy how fast um, time flies. But I, I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas, so three hours south from here, and was really fortunate, man, just to have uh, a GA position pretty much kind of fall in my lap when I was finishing my undergrad and didn't really know what the next steps for my life were, and um, I, I jumped right into it. Uh, at the time, I was just a personal trainer in the rec center, just kind of finding my way and, and trying to figure out what to do. And, and so it's my alma mater. I graduated, had my first job really as a strength coach. And, and it was just two of us GAs and one full time strength coach in a converted racquetball court. Uh, that, be, that was the one weight room on campus. Whereas before that, we actually trained Division One athletes at the rec center too. So if you could just imagine wow. hauling over Organized hurdles and, and things over to the rec center, sharing racks with Professor Johnson, you know, that that's what it was. So it was a fairly new Division One kind of transition, kind of the same way that like Houston Christian and UI, uh, Incarnate Word, some of those have kind of transitioned over. A lot of us the facilities just hadn't really you know, made the jump yet. Yep. And so Corpus Christi was kind of in that same place. And, um, and that's really all we had in the six year tenure. I was there was, was really that kind of same space. It's a lot better now. They tore down some walls and put Sornix equipment in there. It's pretty sweet. Nice. But, but yeah, man, my first gig, uh, was a GA and then they liked me enough to keep me as an assistant uh, strength coach full time. So that created that position, um, whopping 24 K a year. Uh, so you're welcome so, assistant strength coach yeah. now. But, <laughs> you know, first job and it's, it's like the Richard you know, effect yeah, exactly. yeah. so so it's just cool man when that happens it just goes to show that you know you have an opportunity to show value of, of your own job mm-hmm. which at the time I was like I can't believe I'm getting paid for this like that was really I think a lot of us still feel that way and we take that for granted but man like we really have the best job in the world you know being a strength coach and it's just so much fun and just such a uh, a cool thing to do and and so I was just happy to get paid anything. I was like this is what I want to do, so let's do it and and they ended up finding it so much more valuable that they're going to, you know, create another position for it and then and then the head strength coach left and I became the head guy and so was there until 2016 and then I ended up still kind of being conflicted with the amount of time that I was spending and and having a family now and, and wanting yeah. to, you know, devote more time to to my personal life and and the things that really were mattering a whole lot more at the time. So I ended up transitioning to high school. Got a really cool opportunity at Great Atlanta Christian School. I'm sure we'll talk quite a bit more about that experience because man, it was it was uh it was high level, like high school strength conditioning. It was phenomenal. And it was under the tutelage of Gary Schofield, who's been on many of these podcasts and spoken all over the world because of just the system that he had created at at that school and in Atlanta, what's kind of new to me as a Texan um, it's pretty normal for private schools, which is a gajillion of them in Atlanta, to have mm-hmm. full time strength coaches, like two two of them, sometimes three. And it's like, it's, so I would think you I say it was a step that. up from, sorry, Corpus Christi, like resources and like the facilities and all that yeah. kind of stuff? It was, man. I mean, I was actually making, get, getting paid a whole lot more. So yeah. that was, check check that box, you know, and, and, and working different hours. I mean, college basketball. You know how it is, Zach, with just uh, the commitments of just availability. Like you don't really have holidays or 
or uh, weekends, you know, one of those is kind of just at, at the mercy of of the season and and the 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 length of the season too is just the winter time is rough. But knowing that, okay, I'm going to be working a lot of hours, like you know, twelve hour shifts during the day, but at least I have weekends off. At least we can, you know, we can guarantee that on Thanksgiving Day I'm off because the school is closed. You know, so you kind of go from that college athletics. Um, season demand to, you know, an academic calendar that's of, of school age in, uh, kids, which is really helpful for when you have your own kids, obviously, and you kind of match mm-hmm. their schedules. So, so, yeah, that was a big thing. But resources wise, I mean, the, if you guys seen pictures and videos of the campus, you'd be like, holy crap, like this is <laughs> unbelievable. 80 acres. Um, the, wow. There's a arena on campus, what? which is, and I ended up being a volleyball coach, you know, and coaching there in that arena that it, it, I think it sat five to 7,000 people in that arena. And it's like, just, it's just on campus. That's just where we he, did. He trains kids up. There's a <laughs> indoor football field for a high school here. Yeah. Yes. Never even heard yeah, of So, that. I mean, this is like Texas, obviously it's not, there, it's just private though. I think yeah. that was just the kind of the biggest difference that was super unfamiliar to me, which in private, you know, to be honest, you got a lot more autonomy Yep. Um, to kind of build things and pioneer new things without having to worry about as much kind of red tape. And, and so Atlanta just had some of those benefits. And so, yeah, I mean, I was there for uh, six years as well uh, there before I ended up meeting Lee Smith and now I'm on the dark side of the private sector, you know? So uh, <laughs> Lee just, you know, Maybe an offer I couldn't refuse, man. It was just kind of a cool experience. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what now feels like trainer land, which is, you know, Tim Riley land, you know, a little <laughs> bit like it's like it's still weird land. to be for sure. You know, like when people refer to me as a trainer, I just kind of lose it like inside. But I understand that they don't really know any difference because yep. like, I've just you prefer Richard. As a profession. You prefer Richard. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Richard. It's, not name. It's, Richard just, it's not rich. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, the, it's the coach piece that. Yeah. Like sure. I'm just so used to, you know, preparing teams to win. You know, that's just kind of what you do as, as a coach, and it's just it, it assumes like a pretty stark leadership role with culture building and things. So in the private sector, it's, it's just a shift, in that you're helping individuals do that more so, right? And and it's been an adjustment for me, man. But uh, God is good, and it's just been a really cool experience overall. So, yep. Yeah, so that's you know, college, high school, private, and I plan on being here for as long as I can. I'm really finding a ton of fulfillment and, and loving what we have in Knoxville for sure. Is that tough for you to kind of go from, I assume when you were younger being an intern GA head, did you envision yourself being in college strength conditioning for like a while or was it kind of like an open opportunity where it was like, cool, I'm tra- ready to try something new? You know, I think so. You invest so much to just get your first ever college strength coach job. I mean, your, your CSCCA certification, your CSCS, your networking. I mean, like that's how I met Donnie and Anna. And I just, I was like that young, hungry, like I'm gonna just root myself so deep into this profession and make a name for myself that you of course assume with the amount that I'm investing into this, I'm gonna do this forever. Like I'm gonna keep climbing the ranks. Right. And in college there's a very clear kind of unspoken ladder that you climb of just, the higher level of athletics you get into, whether it's power five, with the peak maybe being the University of Texas, you know, in, in some eyes, that's what you would think is like, I made it. I made it to the mountaintop. And it's like the, you know, the mid-major grind to get there or the D2, D3. So like, even though that's not true, I don't believe that that's the case. I think you can thrive and have a great experience and train great people wherever you are. It doesn't matter if it's mm-hmm. power five or, or D3, but I guess as a 22, 23 year old, that's, that's what you think, mm-hmm. you know, and, and unless you have somebody that's really wise and tells you otherwise, like that's, you're climbing that rank, you know, and then, and then you're all of your wisdom now where you're at Zach, like you would, you would probably say that that's mostly true for your young interns and coaches, but you also want to let them know the reality of our profession, that it's not always better, the higher you climb. And right. it's always very dependent on the situation and the people you work with, yeah. just because you're, out of power five doesn't mean it's that much of a better environment for you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, and then, you know, so to answer your question, it's like, yes, for sure. I would have thought that, but I also knew I wanted to have a wife someday and have a family. And so mm-hmm. that, you know, like there's the shift there of like, okay, what's the best thing to uphold that and to be able to do both. And so that's what stirred the, the high school transition because my wife would pretty much come home every day and just be like, you know, we don't have, we don't have a family. You? Like, what am I going to see you? Yeah. You know, like I'm having a blast. Yeah. We're like playing Georgetown, <laughs> yeah. and like sleeping in right. a king size bed, yeah. eating steak. Uh-huh. Like, you know. and we went, this was, is tight. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. awesome. Yeah. What do you mean? Like, yeah. And any man would have been like, dude, like I'm a college basketball strength coach. I get to hang out with dudes like Zach all the time. And, you know, cause I was big into like, if, wherever we went and played, like I reached out to that coach and we connected. 
we played Cal State Fullerton, Cal State Northridge one time, and, and I'm in Malibu like hiking and then, you know, grabbing some world class food like in between games. And it's just like it's, it's a great life. You know, I mean, it, it, no matter what part of college athletics you're in, you can find a way to really enjoy what athletics brings you, you mm-hmm. know, but at the same time, you're still at the mercy of the demands of you, there's always more to be done to help this team be successful. And so you're 24 seven just spinning your wheels like, how can I? you know, make so-and-so better or the sport coach just dropped, you know, this was kind of bomb on me that some project that we got to work on for so-and-so, you know, and so you're just, <laughs> but, but you're used to it <laughs> and you're committed all in. And then you have a, you know, a spouse at home that's just struggling. And so like, how do how do you, you know, address that? And yeah. so, you know, the, like the man in me wanted to be like, all right, so the solution is I'm going to go power five and make more money and then we'll all be happy. But I just knew that like that necessarily wasn't, probably in my cards. I was only a head strength coach for a year and a half. Like who's going to really hire me to go to that next level and get that bigger job. So I'll be honest, man, I just got on my knees and prayed and just kind of hoped that another door would open that, that would allow for me to essentially do the thing I, I wanted to do and loved, but mm-hmm. also be present at home more. Show up the way that you want and to. That's truly yeah. what happened. Like it's a pretty incredible story, but Gary Schofield, who, I, who I'd mentioned, um, was just allowed to hire a, a, an assistant strength coach. First time ever. Like the, he had been fighting for it forever. He had way too much on his plate. He had built like this monster of a program and it was so successful. So many four and five star kids coming through that program and, and, and it was worldly renowned. Like he would go to Australia and China and Ireland just, just to teach people about how to, I think how I to heard differentiate. Him speak at Texas athletic performance. Oh yeah. Summit once yep. before. And if correct, if, it, if it's who I'm thinking of, he, every class had like a different program. Like I think he basically had freshmen doing like German volume training. And then it was like, <laughs> and then it was like a next level up. And then it was like triphasic. And then there was yep. like a next, there was like a, he had this whole flow chart. That's what the presentation yep. was. Yeah. So imagine pulling that off in a group of 50 kids with one person. You know, those like, are the real coaches, right? Yeah, for hell sure. yeah. But you need a system. Yeah, right? yes. the kids need to understand the system. Yeah, and then you need accountability and culture to keep everybody doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. It's just you and, and forty five kids per class across eight classes. I mean, we it was a machine, man, and it was a glorious machine. But uh, <laughs> and, and, and it still is, and they're doing a great job there now. But you know, for me, stepping into to something like that. You know, was I was only 25. I mean, this wow. I was still I was a Division One head strength coach at the age of 23. So it was wild, just like that young already being the boss. You know, and yep. and it was, it was cool as it was. I Jesus, just knew I'm I needed so glad that. no one gave me that much responsibility at 23. <laughs> you gotta learn what play, a nightmare play. that would have been. <laughs> yep, but here you are. Tim, here I know? am. Yep, yep. All on it's all it's, timing. It's, not, it's right. It's not on my timing. Thank God. Yeah. 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 So I mean, <laughs> so yeah, like the. The story really is Schofield, who again was just allowed to, to hire somebody, had mm-hmm. 48 applicants, like people from MLB and like all over the place, uh, at all different ranks of college, applying for what really was a pretty awesome job to work at a place like GAC and have a, a normal schedule and get paid 50, 60K a year. You know, at the time, you know, pretty good. When, like before rent you're was making, yeah. exactly before rent was what it is now. Um, and he just didn't feel great about any of the candidates. Like he had interviewed some of them, but just didn't quite feel like he, I mean, there was one or two that he really liked, but at the end of the day, like there was, it's a, it's a Christian school. And then like they really take that part seriously. And they want Mm -hmm. people that are legitimate, have a history of pouring into kids and discipling kids. And, um, and I was the FCA huddle leader at the university I was at. So, I mean, it was a big deal for me. And, And so when he essentially, um, uh, kind of had this friction of like, I think I still want to open the door one more time to see who can who who we can get to be interested in this position. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that this was going on. I didn't know who Gary Schofield was, but my mentor, who was a professor at the university, um, knew Gary. They were both regional directors for the NSCA. They both kind of knew each other. Had just been in my office where I kind of vented to him about my family situation of like, man, I'm not seeing my wife. Like it's God, it's a struggle, and I just like tell him all this stuff. And he just had seen Gary post, you know, like on Facebook, kind of one last time, like, hey, is there anybody interested in this position? And then he shared that with me, and I was like, that's yeah, a high school, like you know, again, just mm. st- stuck in the the thought process of like I got to keep climbing right. the ranks. And so I I kind of brushed it off, and he's like, he just kind of looked me in the eyes, and he was just. Like, hey, you really need to take this one seriously. Like, this is different. But being from South Texas, like high school strength conditioning doesn't exist. You know, it's like it's mm-hmm. not it does now. And but at the time 
I just didn't even think that was a possibility. What I've never year heard was of this? What year was this? This is 2015, 2016. Okay. Yep. And so, you know, he he gave me his number. And so I texted him, coordinated a call. I mean, that night I'm on my back porch talking to Gary about the position. And I was just like, I had so much kind of peace like come over me and just kind of looking at my wife, you know, through the window. And it's just one of those moments you never forget of like, this is for sure where God's calling calling us to go next. And having grown up in Corpus Christi, my parents lived there, my wife's parents lived there. Like she, my wife worked on campus too. And so we'd go have lunch together. She was a health clinic director as a nurse. Like people never thought we'd ever leave. You know, right. my closet is just straight blue. Like, from black <laughs> to I mean, you transition up times, you go from blue to orange. You know, right, right. Things, but yeah. it was just like packed full of blue and there was really no other true reason to leave other than just a little bit of like, hey, family comes first, it's adventure. But I also just felt like God was just straight up saying, you have to do yeah. this, like be obedient, like, like just take the plunge. And so, yeah, man, I mean, that was just like a really cool affirmation and moment for me to just trust. We didn't know a single soul in Atlanta. You know, we just uprooted our, our little family. My son, who's now nine, was one at the time. So just just going on this sweet little adventure, you know, going to a, another place and Georgia's beautiful. And it is about 10 degrees cooler, which is <laughs> a big positive, you know, different seasons. but. But yeah, then started this just journey of like when I talked about the machine, I mean, the machine can chew you up a little bit sometimes. So for six years of just kind of shaving years off your life of like 15 hour days kind of catches up at some point. But um, but man, it was it was awesome. GC is a really special place. And I would encourage anybody um, to just look into some of the models they have there for how they execute differentiation in a group setting for different kids, because in, in education, like the big thing is how do I take with a group of 20 kids, take the kid who's who really needs this kind of teaching and this kid who really needs this kind of teaching and this kid's super smart. You know, you have your GT gifted and talented, like you know, mm -hmm. where you were, Tim, right? Like yeah, super smart that. kids, you know, valedictorians, like send them over there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, and that's I, where I, we met. They, they, <laughs> wouldn't, they wouldn't even shake my hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, but in a group setting, how do you pull that off? Like, how do you teach the Tims and the Zacks? And, you know, yeah. really, and so that's our problem too. As strength coaches, it's like, you can have an adult down, uh, adult class downstairs of, you know, 15 people and some of them just want to get yoked and some of them just want to burn calories. And so the system, if you take the time to develop it, will allow for that kind of differentiation to happen. But that's, that's where our profession's headed. It's, we now have the technology to help us guide that a little bit better. We have other people and interns, but, but a place like GEC really did that well. It was awesome. Uh, I'm interested. So, you know, you um, you have all this experience in um, a more traditional SNC setting. And then now you're at Triple F. Um, and well, OK, so before I, I go too far into that, can you talk more? Tell us what Triple F is. Mm -hmm. Tell us where it is. Tell us what it's about. And then how did that transition happen and what has it been like? Triple F is a elite sports training facility in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a 12,000 square foot facility with a basketball gym, two track lanes out back, turf space, uh, podcast room, Heaven. players lounge, Heaven. you know, oh. locker rooms um, for, for kids and members. We have a PS5 in the players lounge where kids can play, you know, double A and just have a blast in there. And, Ping you pong a table, in all the, back, the things. Because I want to. Yeah. That's, actually, that's <laughs> literally where. That's what I. You just described my 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 conference heaven room. Order. You know, and and Lee, just so you know, kind of why all that is the way it is. Played pro sports for eleven years. He's a he was he was a tight end in the NFL. Okay. Bills, Raiders, Bills, Falcons was kind of his journey. All he's ever known is pro level resources. Like he could walk into the practice facility and be like, Hey, Matt Ryan, I'm in the cold tub with you and I'm going to go down here and get a burrito and I'm right. going to, you know, get in the cold tub. And, and I have this team and this, uh, situation where like, I have everything I need to get better. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't matter if from a nutrition standpoint or, you know, film room, like this place provides everything that I need. And so his vision for, for what he wanted ultimately to do in his hometown of he's from Powell, Tennessee, which is just just north of Knoxville. He wanted something like that, but for kids. And if you think about it, how many people are actually, you know, have that mindset of like, I want I want kids to have the same resources that pro athletes have, you know, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a really positive endeavor. Like kids deserve it. Like every middle school boy and girl, like in the, in the state of Tennessee and Texas, like they deserve oh, to awesome. have 
det här går bra. Hey. Det här var... Vi är non-biased här. Um, no, they deserve to have the best resource and equipment, whether they're, you know, come from money or not, man. So, I mean, even Lee's heart was for inner city kids in the area to, to have what we have and kids that grew up without a dad. And like, how do we get him, them in this environment where they can, it's fertile soil is kind of the best way I could describe it. And, you know, the caveat though, is that it's, it's not a school, right? So we still expect kids and parents to get over to triple F, train in the morning, train after school, train when we have breaks, like we have fall break coming up and we'll add more sessions during the day, but it's still a place where because of who works there, like the experts and the people that um, have done kind of it all and have seen a lot of different things in athletics could truly guide the process as well as we can for kids and parents, but to have really almost like a refuge in some way, like if their school isn't filling all the buckets of these things that they need, yes. which a lot of times that's what happens. Yep. And, and I can attest to that. Even the machine that GAC was, there were still a couple of buckets that I couldn't fill for kids. I mean, there's still 45 kids in a room. There's still only so much you can do, even in one of the top high school strength conditioning programs in the country. So so when you have a you know an area of, in Knoxville where there's some phenomenal strength coaches that, that are doing a great job at certain schools, and there's some schools where it's non-existent, like, mm -hmm we kind of have to shift and, and fill these buckets in different ways. And that's really my job. Like my job as the director of athletic development is just is the bucket filler, but also just identifying the buckets and having the relationships with coaches and parents to help bridge those gaps and just dis discern truly what does a kid need? Because if we're only gonna have you for an hour and a half, like once a week, then we're not going to waste that time. Like we're yeah. going to use that time as much as we can to like, man, if you've got no speed work in the last two weeks, guess what we're going to really hone in on and, yeah. and do? Or if like hey, you haven't lifted in, you know, two weeks because in season your coach just doesn't prioritize lifting. Well, we're going to get after it. And so there's 75 schools represented in our in our base of, of student athletes, middle school and high school. And you kind of just don't think that there's that many schools even in Knoxville. But we're talking some elementary schools because we have fifth graders. You know, middle school, high school, there's people that drive an hour and a half to come train in our facility. And it's it's because we can really hone in or prioritize the exact thing that they're missing, you know, that they're not getting. And I have no interest in, you know, doing the same things that they're already getting at their schools. 100%. Like as somebody who has a master's in kinesiology and has studied a lot of physiology, that would be literally, you know, it's a waste of fucking time. Yeah, it's a waste, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it would just be, it would hurt like everything that I know in, in my intuition to add mm -hmm. stress on stress. That just doesn't make any sense. I've I've avoided that like the plague in college athletics because like that's how injuries happen. That's how overtraining works. So, but then there's still that caveat too of some parents and kids thinking that's what they need. Yes. Like less, more speed. Yes. More speed, more speed, you know, more, I want my feet to do this yeah, really but, fast. But, you know? but can, what can we do for, a, do you guys do speed ladders? Um, so look, <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, just a Texan thing? Uh, I want to, did you, I want to unpack everything that you just kind of touched on because there, there are some big things that come up for me when you're talking about. Let's talk about with the privacy. The intricacy. <clears throat> of the things that you're navigating. Yeah. Um, and I think the first thing, maybe a good place to start is 75 schools represented. How many kids are rolling through there on a About weekly basis? 170, 180 in our membership base. But, okay. you know, as far as, you know, can do, when you say weekly basis, I mean, some kids are just so in, insanely busy and occupied with travel baseball or volleyball yep. that it's the club sports plus the high school sports. That's like, man, there might be certain times of the year where they're just getting treatment. Like they're yep. just coming in to see in sports med. And then on a Sunday, getting some lat pull down on leg press, and then they're out. Whereas some kids, we're seeing them six days a week, and we're doing 90% of their development just because mm -hmm. of where they're at. So, yeah. So, you touched on something that I've learned just through experience is I, too, if a kid comes in and, you know, uh, they have goals, right? And I asked them about what they've done this past week and what the plans are from the strength training program and practice load and all that mm -hmm. stuff for the next few days, right? Yep. I try and gather as much information as I can mm -hmm. so I can make an informed decision as it pertains to their goals and what they want to get out of training, what we're going to do that day. Zach had a quote on the podcast last week. He said, periodization is dead. <laughs> okay. Now we talked about that today. Yeah. So um, people, um, I, you know, for me personally, it's like, I, I, I want to have a plan. I have a North star. I want to get you to your goal. Here's kind of loosely what that plan looks like. Yep. But based on the information we have at hand, we have to make the best decision for mm -hmm. today. Um, doing that with 
some kids are gone, some kids are coming back. Some kids are in season, some kids are out of season. You have groups. How, and you, you mentioned you're a bucket filler. Mm -hmm. This is a two part question. One, how do you go about the education process, communicating to the athletes and parents that the best thing for them is what they need right now, right? So like educating them mm -hmm. around like wh why it's important to fill a bucket at a specific time. Mm -hmm. And then two, how do you accomplish that? Um, it's a big question, sorry. No, it's, it actually could be answered pretty simply because of the time I took to invest in our system, which is like this assessment we do before you ever train at Triple F. So okay. before you ever do a single session, I mean, you might, it, just depending on how we schedule it, a session or two prior to me finally doing the assessment with you, but with our hundred or so members that that have come through here, some of them are you know brand new and some have been with us for a while. They all have had to do uh, about a 55 minute assessment with me where I look at those eight buckets, right? I, the, the eight qualities are, see if I can do it off the top of my head. We got size, so it's just kind of frames, uh, height and weight, I, we don't do body comp or anything. Flexibility, it's this 10 minute screen with a PVC pipe that's like an FMS, but a little bit more specified of like, what are my ankles like? You know, what what are my hamstrings like? So I, I got the ASLR in there. We got uh, a Kelly Sturette, which you should bring him on the podcast. He's a man. Love Kelly Sturette. Um, shout out Kelly Sturette. K-Star, get in here. Shout out. I, listen, Supple Legend. Leopard might have been my first training uh a uh, piece of we'll get him uh, in this room for sure he's a <laughs> literature legend. um but man like he's just so pragmatic with his mobility stuff of like are my ankles you know tight you know how much dorsiflexion i have well there's one test where you just narrow stance squat just squat as deep as you can without your heels coming up and i scored it a one a two and a three so kind of adopted the fms way of scoring because it's super convenient and then just taking that so they so we have that we have how inflexible or flexible you are it's on it's from zero to 35 the lowest score you can really get uh because there's eight tests in there that are unilateral is like a 12 i did have a kid get a 13 the other day so he, <laughs> we, so he's got I a lot of work to do that. yeah got a, yeah, exactly. yeah a lot of room to grow that. though you know <laughs> yeah, yeah a lot of yeah. room so for guess opportunity what his bucket uh you know which bucket we're <laughs> the filling priority, for him, you yeah. know amongst others but then uh <laughs> there's kids that have a 35 and it's like guess what you don't really need to be doing a whole lot of is, yeah uh, from an intervention standpoint is stretching and mobility so but some kids need a mobility intervention asap like it is it's a stability issue it's a strength issue but there's a reason why you can't access your body and so okay where are we at with that one that's number two number three upper body power strength it's again i only have 55 minutes and i and i really carved this up really strategically because of like if i'm one-on-one -on -one with you and i could do this as many with, with two or three other kids in that setting i want to be able to just measure it all like in this one instance which is kind of tough to do like you're putting the body through a lot but thankful for technology to allow me to get more information with less testing so like we on bench press i just standardize uh stages based on their body weight. So let's see how well you move 30% of your body weight. Let's see how, move you, how well you move 45%. Some kids, that's it, they're done. They couldn't mm -hmm. get 10 reps of 45% of their body stubborn. weight, we're done. So got the information I needed, next test. You know, whereas some kids, they'll go all the way to stage six, which is 105% of their body weight, which in high school is pretty dang impressive. Like yeah. you mentioned that, you know, there's a few kids that can do that. So that stage might take longer. And then we got lower body power, which is just simply counter movement jump on the Hawken Dynamics force plates. Like we just hit two or three of them move on I, I basically tell them in the moment like this is how I find out how strong your legs are because at the end of the day we could one rep max a couple things right at GEC I did that we did one rep max on back squat to hamstring parallel I did a rear foot elevated split squat max we did a de trap bar deadlift max and mostly because we could and we had a whole week right and it's like let's and strength was a massive priority in a controlled environment yeah. where you did have periodization you did yes have you could control for everything because yeah, you were the school right 100%. whereas in this environment it's like man if ultimately we're just trying to get your legs more powerful then let's measure power and then we'll find out Mm -hmm. kind of what's lacking, you know, up to that point. I don't, and I don't want to one rep max a 12 year old. I just don't. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. First there. session. So, let's go. Just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, maybe they can squat. Maybe they can't. Yeah. Probably can't. You know. I'm scared yeah. to death of just yeah. even being in that <laughs> right. facility. Yeah. yeah. Or your bed. And it's Let's like go. you get into the idea of like the skill aspect too of oh, like how massive every, skill. Yeah. I think the force <laughs> like, plate's a very intelligent play. Yeah, smart move, Rich. And yeah, thank you. So I just spent <laughs> a lot of time with yeah, thank you. A lot of time with Drake. <laughs> I think his name is just Drake, so we can call him Drake. Uh, you know, Berberay from Hawken and just like hey man, let's let's like 
help me figure out the best way to find out how strong a uh, 12 year old's legs are without loading them externally. And so I decided on the five to seven metrics that I thought were telling me that, and then it kind of moved on. So that's the fourth thing. Fifth is RSI babies, elasticity. We'll get into that quite oh, a bit, yeah. but you know, I, I'm borderline obsessed with kind of assessing elasticity and finding better ways to do it. But man, how springy are you? Richard, could you tell us what you use to test that RSI? He's, what are you talking about? Uh, are, are we uh, are we talking about the plyomat here? Yeah, we are. Let's yes. freaking go! Yes, official sponsor of the show, baby. <laughs> Coach Mup is proud to be sponsored by Plyomat. Plyomat is a jump mat that measures ground contact times, vertical jump height, and reactive strength index. Plyomat's trusted by over 750 coaches in 25 different countries. It's something that you can use in training day in and day out to give immediate feedback and drive output and intent. Plyomat's always in stock. When you order your Plyomat, you can get it within one to three business days and start your training immediately. If you get a group of athletes challenging each other to jump higher, get off the ground quicker, it transforms that workout into a highly competitive, highly potent stimulus. If you would like access to the best jump mat on the planet, use Coach em Up 5 to get 5% off at checkout. Again, code Coach em Up 5 for 5% off. Come jump with us, get a plow mat. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so you get R the, yeah, RSI, RSI and then agility and then acceleration and speed. So it's eight things. So eight qualities in general, which I graph it on a radar plot. And it's just really funny to see some kids are just like, choop, choop, and then that's it. It's just yeah. like, a, I'm big and I have a strong upper body and mm -hmm. I got nothing else. You know, like I'm, yeah. it's all percentile based. Yeah. And, and the kids that are division one athletes, they look like circles. You know, it's mm -hmm. like size might be a little bit of an indention. Uh, flexibility might be a little bit indentured because at the end of the day, flexibility doesn't always equal sports performance. And that quick visual, so going back to the question you asked of how do you educate people on prioritizing when it's to be prioritized, that's exactly that. You show Got them it. that graphic and it's immediately like, wow. Yep. You know, little Johnny is just, he is slow, yep. you know, and but he's pretty strong, you know, or he's flexible. Or, right. Worst case scenario, they're like a little There's mustard seed. There's just a little oh, tiny, tiny like dot. A, like a younger athlete who's already probably not confident with this kind of stuff, and they come in and their circle's really smaller. Yeah. How do you go about presenting that so you know they're not just like, I suck, well. Yeah, I mean, that's what's, <laughs> thankfully, like, you know, as a coach, our job is to breed confidence in the people. And, yeah. and, and we just have a you know, a skill set and that alone and just like making people feel amazing is like part of my job, man. It's what, it's what we do. It's like, you know, I'd, if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't be very good at, at what I do. Like, I, it's just so important to instill confidence in anybody, no matter where they're at. Because mm -hmm. even the most athletic kids that walk in our facility are suffering from lack of confidence, too. So it, even though they got a big circle, you know, they still um, might have issues with other things. But at the end of the day, man, that kid that just has, is so new to it, those are the kids that fire me up because mm -hmm. I'm like, man, like, just wait till you see, like, the transformation that's about to happen. And I've, like having worked in high school especially where i left in a division one environment where 100 percent of my athletes were division one athletes if you think about that like yeah. it's when you say that's that out loud yeah. it's like that's yeah, wild 100 percent of you guys Are somebody told me that once level. and i was like wow like i'm about to I'm go start to using that set on my resume 100 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. percent of the athletes i work with are d1 <laughs> it's true you know it's like i mean some are walk-ons yeah they're still there right you know they're, they're on the team Made squad. and then you go to a high school where it's like maybe five percent of you guys actually might make it and maybe we have a couple of y'all that are like five star like legit but mm -hmm. 10% of this population now that I'm working with are Division One athletes, 5%. I mean, if you're lucky, like three to five. And so it just really shifts your perspective on like, okay, well, in the high school setting, we're still just trying to win games and we're trying to have a positive experience. And so the bottom floor, next man up, that that's what we do as strength coaches, man. Like, our, I mean, it's cool to train NFL guys and, and the Lambo rolls in and you get to fine tune it and make it a little bit faster and like right. overclock it a little bit, but like, you know, when a beat up full escort, you know, comes to the parking lot and you're a mechanic and you get to just strip that thing apart and just make it like a Ford Escort with a spoiler. Now we're yeah, talking you know, yeah. swap out the engine. Some rims on it. You know, put some rims yeah. on it. Yeah, hell some yeah. people, some that's tent. the first thing they do, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Paint job and rims, you so, know. Subwoofers going in the back of that bad boy immediately. Yes. Yes. It's actually a great way to understand strength conditioning, really. Because like, but those, you know, it's still a Ford Escort, but man, like, now it's a Ford Escort that plays varsity, at least, you know, yeah. like some people, there's one kid, I know he would love, you know, me mentioning him and talking about him, but like, like he came in as a sophomore, never had really any formal training at all. 
and like now he's starting on varsity. It was a situation. Hell I mean, yeah. in one year, really, like in ten months, like this, you kind of would look at him and be like, man, like I don't know if 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 you really can achieve your goals because yeah. kids have goals. So I want to play varsity. I want to be a contributor on my team. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily get a college scholarship. They just want to play and yep. like be you know valued on their team because football is important to them or any sport. And 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 to see that happen because of the work. At the end of the day, like you know, we're not. Smokes and mirrors at Triple F, man. I mean, if 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 you get anything from me as like a actual college strength coach and a high school strength coach, like we're gonna freaking work because nothing replaces the work. So you don't just show up and foam roll and you know do exercises that look cool. It's like no, right. we're gonna like truly work and grind and do the things that we need to do. And that kid did that. And like his circle, if you just look at him, you know, it's just like it, it doubled in size and in all different directions. And so God. super satisfying to see that visual so take fulfilling. place. Yeah, it is. And, and then, you know, the second question you asked him was, how do you actually guarantee that that happens? This is the tricky part. So this is like, it makes it sound like I've got it all figured out in terms of like assessing and all that. And it's, it's a good system. It's not perfect like anything, but actually filling the buckets that need to be filled comes down truly to just schedule and like can so we even true. get them in the in Dude. the course man so it's like physiologically like getting the gains that you want and the goals that you want you have to be extremely upfront like this is going to take a lot of time like this is you're going to have to your social life is going to have to take a hit hopefully academics don't but you're going to have to give up some stuff and just mm -hmm. so i try to have those like hard conversations early because people are about to invest, you know, some money into this thing and, and and invest time, and they're excited. They got this energy, like I want to get better. I want to, you know, yeah, it get, all get sounds good buckets. at the at so the doing point, it every day. you know, at the at <laughs> the point of conversation. But then at five forty two a.m., six weeks into it, you know, when you said that six fifteen a.m. was going to be your time, like, and you're everything's telling you not to come in. So I mean, that's that's the nature of of what we do, man. And so like half the battle then is still just cueing kids and parents to like come on get get, get in. in the doors like yeah just show well, up don't feel like just because you also ran at school that you're worried that we're going to make you run again like there's still some of that disconnect sometimes with some families and some kids who just don't fully understand what we do so they think that what they just did at school that day is kind of the same thing Counts. they have practice and it's like man get in here let's have that conversation let's spend the five or ten minutes yep. to triage let's let's get all the information oh, you on ran the table. oh your coach made you run 40 40 yard sprints today <laughs> which by the way happened this yeah. year we they, did they worked up 250 yeah. Yeah. just yep anyway um yeah and it's like oh that's, that's what you did fantastic yeah. go lay down yeah. <laughs> you make yeah. 40 more go to the podcast <laughs> room grab a pillow that's right you know, yeah yeah like, yeah just uh -huh. go take a nap and then sometimes that might be the biggest performance increase is the parasympathetic <laughs> nervous system getting some attention for once but you know it's like navigating that whole process across 170 180 kids can be challenging right sure. because now it's like I, I know i do a pretty good job of knowing our kids and their situations well and their coaches but you still don't know everything no. it's impossible to get Not all there. that information yep you know with 15 to 18 athletes in a college basketball scenario it's also like a lot of work to to constantly get this information accurate information you know mm -hmm. so much less kids that are different coaches and different coaching styles and oh that coach just left they have a new coach and he does this way differently so it's like okay now we got to shift and it's like how do we fill these buckets and make sure we're not filling the ones that are overflowing and it's just it's a it's a logistical constraint but um but at the end of the day these kids can can handle a lot it's it's more of a concern of like the sport demands of like club and high school that i i worry about because it's like that's that's a lot like to balance out the, cl uh, the club demands of just three four hour practices it's crazy it's it's wild so and the travel like yeah like, like travel, baseball like, travel baseball it's like whole, like oh, well, i don't even it's know it's crazy you, you just talk lacrosse your hands is up. that way too dude do you have a, do you have a lot of lacrosse ath athletes we do and, and and i'm glad you brought that up are the club lacrosse scene in Knoxville still growing? So mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of like super competitive clubs yet. And so guess where they have to go to actually get, you know, if they're really talented, they go to Atlanta and they go to Nashville. And oh, it's like, yeah. now you're you're going driving three hours for a lacrosse practice for club. And it's that's just nuts. like, yeah, it is nuts. But the parents are convinced that that's the best way to get the challenge that they yep. need to. And it's yep. hard to argue with that. So it's in their mind worthy investment. And then here I am trying to get them to come train and develop. And yeah. it's like, that's not as important to them in that in that situation. So it's uh, it's tough. It's tough because the parents, the messaging they receive is like, if your kid doesn't do 
play on this second club team. No chance. That they're going to get left behind. No. And it's it's hard because like maybe maybe you know also you know but then also they're trying to balance them being developed physically no. you know and we had uh daniel bach on the podcast shout out daniel um who had a really compelling conversation regarding the importance of an off season mm -hmm. um particularly in younger athletes no. um and citing some of his experiences and what reflects mine as well where uh, and we kind of touched on it a little bit ago about how sometimes kids have two weeks off they do nothing no they come back and they jump three inches higher, <laughs> you know, just because they've been getting buried with their sport practices and mm -hmm. tournaments or whatever it is that they have going on. Um, Pushing the off button is pretty effective sometimes. Yeah. You know? yeah um, but it's, it's that rat race of like, well, if I do this, then I'm, I'm behind. And yep. so it's like, an, it's, it's tough, man. It's like, I call it a rat race very intentionally because that's a lot of what it feels like with the youth sports model that are, wonderful country is kind of created with just capitalism is an awesome thing, but like, and there's just so many people that are taking advantage of like these rankings and like yes. these camps. And so like, as a parent, it's just so overwhelming to navigate that, like mm -hmm. which camp is actually going to help and which, you know, exposure this and development this and like, and this is happening earlier and earlier and earlier to where you feel like you, I, people already got to see what I'm capable of as mm -hmm. a seventh grader. It's like, well, I mean, no, but you know, like let's let's just develop first, and then the whole exposure thing will make more sense. But like the rankings are just like starting sooner and younger and younger, and it's like it's it's kind of scary, man. Like just from a parent perspective. So a lot of the conversations we have is just helping them navigate that. Like, and they'll ask us all the time, you know, what should I even go to this camp? Is this worth it? It's like, how about you just come to Triple F and train? Like, yeah. those are two training sessions that that you may have missed out on and and lost some development because now you're just gonna go perform at this camp. And there's a huge difference between performance and development. <laughs> if all you do is just perform, 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 which, you know, it's kind of what we did in the weight room today. Yeah. You know, we just get excited and you just go for a single, you <laughs> know, yeah. it's like- The best. It always I, devolves to that, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Like, like if yeah. you strength coaches get together, it's like, what are we doing today? It's like cleans. It's like, we're gonna hit a heavy yeah. single. <laughs> yeah. That's what's happening. We're here. not pulling out the derivative main <laughs> no, of like, let's hell no. five, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, like we're just develop today, you know, yeah. but it ends up, yeah. When a couple, bunch of dudes get together, <laughs> you know- Just dudes you, being you're, bros. You're gonna, you're gonna hit let's, let's talk about that. So we were uh, ripping some cleans and squats today. Yep. And then we kind of got down the rabbit hole of RSI. Yep. Can you explain to everyone what it is, what it isn't, and kind of how you fell in love with this? Absolutely, man. Yeah, we can spend a good amount of time on this, mostly because um, it's it's an important conversation with, like, everybody does plyos, but not everybody truly understands kind of the elasticity component as far as the ability to quantify it. And it's not that you have to quantify every plyometric drill or activity you do, but when you're training athletes, an athlete sometimes has a really hard time understanding time spent on the ground and why sometimes it's important to spend a lot of time on the ground depending on what activity you're doing. But if you're trying to become more stiff and build elasticity, there's some drills that like, man, we, we want to create as much energy in as little amount of time as possible. That's what RSI is. Mm -hmm. RSI is a very simple metric. Uh, it's, it's gotten some heat over the last few years because of how simple it is. But it's like, you know, it, it's simple in a, in, a, in a healthy way. You just have to understand context like anything else. Um, it's usually done with two legs and it's usually like five or ten hops in a row where, you know, you're just the, the, the springy pogo jumps that you're doing. And, um, and to be clear, like within speaking of context, when doing those jumps, the goal is to get to jump as high as you so, can so that, yeah. so and that's get off the ground as quickly as possible. Correct. And that supports okay. the math, right? So the math favors minimal contact time. So the math is this. It's flight time divided by contact time. And there's other ways to calculate it. You can do uh, jump height in meters divided by contact time, and it ends up being just a smaller number. I mean, it's, it's just, you can massage the numbers however yeah. you want. But uh, traditional RSI is how much time am I spending in the air divided by how much time I spend on the ground. So the athlete will immediately, just like you inquired, like, okay, so how do I get better at this? Do I jump higher or do I be quicker? And it's like, well, both, but let's prioritize the quickness piece of it. And and so the quadrant that I've come up with um, that 
it kind of basically says that point two is like the middle ground and 12 inches is kind of the middle ground of like right in the middle of if I jump 13 inches, I'm kind of above that line of jumping high enough. But if I'm doing that in a point two two, then it's a little too slow. So mm. if I hit a 12 inches in a, in a point one eight, then that's considered like springy. That's pretty good. You know, if I'm staying under the, the you know, the point two threshold, but I'm jumping at least 12 inches, that's pretty good. And between male and female, there's not a huge discrepancy with this test in particular. We have some girls that are hitting 4.0 in and RSI and, and, they're, and it's not because they're jumping super high. Like you take any, like, I don't know if Texas has acrobatics or like, I mean, a cheer and dance, tum like anybody that tumbles or like that so crazy. springy track jumpers, I mean, like it's effortless. Um, the way, even sprinters, like they're just, they're so used to creating a lot of energy in a small amount of time, right? That's what they do that the stiffness and springiness is something you don't have to teach them. Basketball players, tennis players, soccer players, court sports, like it's, it's pretty normal. Their feet are just like what got them to where they are. And so another way to kind of explain it, it's like, it's kind of measuring foot speed a little bit, you know, cause it's lower extremity stiffness, like how stiff in my ankles and, and systematically how stiff am I at the point of contact that determines the score. And in my experience and nine years playing with this, it's like the athletes that really have the most trunk, like, and, and Stuart McGill actually did a study comparing RSI with like trunk strength, core strength, and, and, and a volleyball team that I had tested before, girls with the highest relative trap bar deadlift had some of the highest RSIs. So it's just like systematic stiffness and timing of that in the moment. Whereas if you have a weak core and you can't deadlift for crap, then you know, it, it's hard pressed to say that you can withstand that much force in that quick amount of time. So that's what's been cool for me is just affirming that in the weight room. Like the weight room really does help with plyos mostly because of just a st from a stiffness standpoint those muscles have to be so incredibly strong to allow that tendon to actually store any sort of energy mm -hmm. like if the there's always this conversation with uh or controversy with sprinters do they even need a lift because i guess it was carl lewis who never like lifted he just you know he just sprinted and you never saw him in the weight room yet he's one of the fastest human beings on the planet and and a lot of that is supported by like he already had just incredible trunk strength and stiffness whereas a lot of people do not so there's a lot of people that do not have <laughs> yeah. that sort of systematic uh strength to be able to tolerate that much load in that quick amount of time and again in my in my experience the athletes that are pretty good weight room athletes can pull a lot of weight and they got the springs like those are the ones that are usually scoring a lot of touchdowns what so are the things, things you do that really move the needle on rsi from a novice athlete to like a high level advanced athlete, what are the different things you do to help with that? So like looking at that quadrant kind of helps because it's not always as simple as let's just do this drill if your RSI is low. Two people can get the same RSI score in completely different strategies. Like you can have somebody get a 3.0 because they jumped 16 inches off a of 0.21. Nice. Or you can have somebody that got a 3.0 that uh, jumped 12 inches on a 0.15. So like, you have your more elastic athletes and mm -hmm. if you're more force dominant athletes, you could for sure argue and make a case for Squirrel White at, at Tennessee, Go Vols, Go Vols, who's in the four fives or fives on our side, just extremely oh springy. God. He probably doesn't need to do a whole lot of like elastic type plots. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, maybe, like slower maybe stuff. have him grab a trap bar and do like some loaded jumps. So maybe, yeah, again, there's a lot of this is theoretical, but sure, maybe sure. drive him towards, he's already got that extreme elasticity. So if we are gonna train him and try to get him stronger and even more explosive, maybe it's more of like loaded jumps and that's slower. I need more contact time, depth drop jumps from a higher depth, but I have more time to gather. And then you mm. have an athlete who's on the complete opposite end of like an offensive lineman who's 320 pounds, you know, who's a sophomore in high school and it was just like their whole life didn't do any sort of like basketball or like, yes. you know, they're uh -huh. just- He's they're been just a fat. lineman. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yes. I'm a lineman. He's you know, a, a lineman. Like, That's I don't what do he this does. stuff. Yeah. You know, no soccer, like, no cross training, yeah. no nothing. Yeah, yeah. Those are the ones that like, dude, have you seen like a real lineman before? Because their <laughs> right. feet are unbelievable. Like they <laughs> yeah. are incredibly athletic creatures and usually the ones playing at the highest level played basketball and That's right. did all the things. So they were also ginormous, but they were incredibly shifty and athletic too. Like, don't don't get it twisted. And so, those are the ones that are like, let's just jump rope. Let's just see if we can jump rope for twenty seconds straight, or like some low threshold plyos because they're way down here on the bottom right of the quadrant that says that I'm not jumping high and I'm not quick. And so, those are the ones 
who need a very different plyometric program, you know, but typically what happens in a group setting, you know, high school and, and college primarily, private sector, you can kind of individualize a little bit more. You know, everybody's doing the exact same plyometric drill. We're all doing right. skaters, we're all doing pogos, we're all doing bounds. And in some college settings, it's like, well, the skill guys will do bounds while the big boys will just do prowler sprints or something mm -hmm. like that. So you kind of separate those buckets. But but even some of your skill guys probably need to be doing, you know, maybe the prowler pushes or, you know, vice versa. So it, that plyometric profiling piece really helps with that. And that's kind of why I created the plyo mat. I wanted to understand more prescriptive plyos, knowing that not every plyo is the same. And, and it just kind of opened my mind up to realizing that, you know, this one very important style of training that is in everybody's programming, which is plyometrics, still can go a, little, a bit deeper to make sure that we're targeting the right things. And so that's what the quadrant was kind of designed for. And it's kind of becoming more normal now. But we also need to understand that like bilateral hopping for an RSI score still doesn't tell you the whole story. Like yeah. what about lateral like stiffness? If I'm doing a single, we're playing around with a kind of skater into a pop off the mat, land on the yep. mat. Cause it's a very, it's now a different plane. It's single leg, you know, how it's changed like direction. Me, I'm really like, if you get me, like if we pulled out the plow, if we stayed a little bit longer and, and played around with some of the other depth drop stuff, I'm really good at popping off that mat on two feet and landing. I'll get like a 4-0 and feel good about myself. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but single leg, it's just a disaster. Yeah. Like it's terrible. So that would also so, be so me. springiness then is like, all right, well, did I need to do single leg plyos? Mm -hmm. And I know I do. Like I know I'm terrible. I'm a terrible one foot jumper. It just looks awkward, feels awkward. Is there anyone um, who shouldn't just be doing single leg hops? Honestly, no, nobody. <laughs> right? No. Shout plus, out Matt Watson. Plus, yeah. Hops never leave the program. Plus plyos, baby. <laughs> and, and again, it's just a it's a necessity that not many people um, play with. But like sprinting, kind of as a unilateral plyo. In totally, for sure. So like you know, there's there's other ways that you can address that. But like at the end of the day, like attack the weak points. That's mm -hmm. what we're all. This whole discussion has been about that so far. But for most like middle school kids, which is a lot of what we train at Triple F, they need everything, yeah. a little bit of everything. So we're not doing these hardcore plyometric profiles, knowing that they've never even done a plyo before yeah. in their life. So well, that's what I, my next question was going to be. You know, I'm a coach. I want to implement plyos with my high school team. Um, how do I go about progressing that so we don't run into shin splints, knee issues, all that kind of stuff? So what do you kind of do, like ground level, almost like assessment, even before you get into jumping? Yeah. So, I mean, Matt actually had an awesome post, and now his posts are so aggressive now. I don't know. You know, he's like angry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you see all his reels are just like, like a big attack. It's like, <laughs> it's like, why aren't you doing bounding? You're doing bounding wrong. And uh -huh. he did have one where he talked about how and I, and I can attest to this like as a young strength coach I just thought bounds were just like so hardcore it was just like man you know I don't know if we're ready to bound yet like it just seemed so intense like you know what I'm talking about right yeah, like, you know it's like bounds one. were like the yeah the most hardcore exercise you clean a jerk and bounce bounds. and you're like yep. you're you're there I remember and you would be so cautious because of like the shin stuff and just how intense it is and and so like most athletes probably shouldn't be doing like these extreme 30 yard linear bounds with like max uh, intensity and being cued on quick ground contact time, but rather let's start short. Just like Matt said on the video, let's just do these, let's bound with what we can handle. I'm still able to do the movement, but it's just with so much less intensity and it, you're able to do that with the bounds. You know, there's bounds are, are pretty awesome. Like you can do lateral bounds, linear, you can do like a bound bleed that John Garish does, which is like an in place. Let me start with the skater and then gradually go higher and then like, and then oh, stop. Cool. And it's like, do that a few times. And man, like, I've taught kids who just had almost no stiffness in their body to just create that stiffness and who didn't know how to before just by simply doing what they knew they could do and find stiffness with, which is typically lateral. Like everybody yeah. can do a skater. Like almost, yeah. that's kind of like your go-to, let's start lateral first and then work more vertical. And then now lateral or diagonal to more linear, usually like even with our pro guys, like I still would rather start like, let's just Euro step it a little bit yep. and then and then go for it. Because the stiffness just isn't there yet. Like yeah. it's just like my my trunk's not awake. Like I'm, there's so much force in such a little amount of time. So yeah, I would for sure start with some skaters, some kind of lateral to linear, lateral to vertical progressions. John Garris does a good job of. He has a course on bounding that's phenomenal for that. Uh, I got a video too of a, a 12 year old kid doing it on my on my Instagram, and it's like really basic routine. And I if filming that, I just didn't think it was going to turn out. I just felt like, man, let me film this. Let me yeah. just see like 
if people need to not just see pro athletes all the time doing like impressive plyos, they need to see like a kid like navigate this for the first time and, and actually look pretty good. And mm -hmm. it's like, that's, and that took what, five minutes. So you can really check your plyometric box um, with some kind of lower threshold jumps like that in five to 10 minutes and then move on to, to other things. So it's just being intentional. And it's like anything else, uh, the drills that you pick are important. I didn't pull out the plyo mat. I wasn't having him like measuring contact time every time. Mm -hmm. I was just guiding him through that process, but I love building in a plyo mat kind of station you know, paired with like a, you know, a lift. So we'll do like a max RSI or like a depth drop jump. And, you know, just like with anything, man, you, a kid sees that screen and that number and they, it starts teaching them what it actually is, the more reps they get and it like they compete and they, you get great effort out of them. So yeah, quantifying your plyos is not by any means not essential, but can really drive performance for sure. The Coach Em Up podcast is sponsored by Squat Wedgies. Tim, what are Squat Wedgies? Squat Wedgies are an adjustable squat wedge, seven, 13, and 20 degrees. It's big enough to elevate your whole foot and not just your heel. Because it's rubber, it doesn't slide on surfaces. It's 22 pounds, so it's durable and stable enough for even your biggest athletes. There's a 90 day risk-free trial. The shipping is free and get 15% off squat wedgies with our discount code coach them up 15 coach them up 15 for 15 percent off of the best squat wedge on the planet i just got my new watch from amaze fit it's called the t-rex 3 and this is the best watch i've ever had in my life this is a thousand dollar watch getting it 279 which is ridiculous which value. is absurd it just looks good dude military grade stainless steel ai voice control water resistant up to a hundred meters it tracks your heart rate it has maps battery life dude once every 20 seven days. Yeah. That's incredible. The selection that I have for my watch faces, my heart rate, how many steps I've taken. The UV index. UV index is important for your boy. I use my watch as a stopwatch all the time. As if all that wasn't good enough, you get a discount because you're listening and watching us. 15% dude. Amazefit.com slash coach them up, or you can click the link below. 15% off the best watch on the planet. Now back to the episode. So you, you touched on the piece why I actually love it the most. And that's the way I've used it in training. Um, uh, the most is by setting up like we've got two stations mm -hmm. and you know what I did at first because I, I just didn't have, have any experience using a jump mat of any kind plow mat was my first uh, jump mat ever and like I was like okay like the, the game essentially I was like who's going to get the fastest ground contact time yep. right but what I didn't do and I it, it, it took me like two times through for me to figure out I'm like oh they've figured it out no, no one's jumping far <laughs> You know, yeah. no one's jumping high. Like, okay, I they're can play just, your game. They're like, Beth, yeah. yeah. And so like yeah. everyone's talking, yeah. they're talking shit. The energy's great, but I know that they're not, and they're feeling validated because the number's going down, mm -hmm. but I know not nothing's being want. trained no right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're not, we're not yeah. really training. I mean, we might be getting some awareness as to what yeah. a quick contact Who's your progression? Like. That's what uh, your progression was. So. Yeah. Um, what I did is I gave them markers for each of their individual distances. And I said, Hey, you're getting off the, this plyo mat as fast as you can, yeah. but you got to land on the, That's on where the, setting like a minimum contact is good. Cause like what I've experienced with kids, of course, is like, you'll say, Hey, as quick as you can, as far as you can, like, all right. And so as far as next I can thing go. you know, it's just like, they just have a spasm like it's like that wasn't actually a jump like what was yeah, that like, was, well, you, like they're going to organize their body to do like you know whatever just to, like they turned it into something else so, uh -huh. so then it's like and it's hard for them but like hey jump as far as you can but as long as it's not slower than a point two yeah you're able to maximize because they want to maximize both qualities which is pretty tough to do obviously if they're not as mature uh with that drill you're doing but like hey get as far as you can but I won't count this distance unless it's at least a point two. Mm -hmm. so now you kind of set that cutoff. I love it. So that that guarantees that you are getting the stimulus that you want. Because that's the thing with plyos, man. If you don't quite quantify visually too with what is quick enough, there's this whole conversation about what determines a slow plyo versus a, a fast plyo. And people have said like 250 milliseconds or 0.25 or yeah, right. 0.2 is like that threshold. Is it Vershansky like, that was like the original, the yeah, 0.25? So, yeah. 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 Right. Well, there's actually a, a researcher in Germany, I forget his name, but like, you know, I have all these articles and things that I had like uh, in my RSI journey trying to uncover 
these parameters because I wanted to establish these parameters of sure. what is a, a quick enough plyo. And so you can kind of slot these things in and yeah, 250 or 200 milliseconds. But then there's some things that need to be like a one five. Like when Usain Bolt ran his record breaking hundred meter dash, like he, his contact time at his peak speed was a 0 0.09. So it just kind of makes you appreciate God, like that much. And Tyson Gay was 0.10. That was the difference. Like the difference between two guys, you know, running a hundred meter dash, one sets so the world crazy, record and one dude. doesn't. Usain Bolt is producing that much force in 0.09 seconds. That's crazy. Like, That's the differentiator between average Joe Schmoes and these elite athletes. Yeah. It's like how quickly they it's can It's time. At the end of the day, it's time. And uh, ground time, air time, these things are becoming kind of more you know looked at as far as like assessing like 40-yard dash, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my first three steps, like how much ground time is optimal versus air time. And you can really dig into that and, and take it to kind of another level. But at the end of the day, like if you're doing a plyo for the purpose of increasing elasticity, but yes. you still want output, yep. setting that parameter is really all you need to do. And then the kids get it. That's smart. I never thought of setting a minimum. Yeah, because otherwise That's it's brilliant. hard. To, uh, they just kind of get carried away with both. Totally. And, yeah, trust me. Because I've, I've, whenever I haven't done that and I yeah. just said, yeah, as fast as you can, They'll try to get a one two, but it just looks literally like a, a spasm. Yeah, you know, it yeah, just doesn't totally. really look like there's like they're having a seizure. Yeah. It's like yeah. instead of doing the drill that you want, because more is not always better. Like right. the fastest ground contact time where you turn the force down isn't helping anybody either. So yeah, that's what uh, the technology has helped us do is just like identify what is what are you okay with being fast enough and then kind of knowing what that looks like and the kid knows what it feels like. So they can then take the associated quickness from the RSI testing they did. And then you can use that two days later when we're all doing pogos on the turf. Like, hey, man, quick, quick off the turf, just like we measured RSI. And so you just say that word RSI or springiness, and then they remember that's what got them a good score when they tested it. And and then now your plyo went from being just a bunch of sloppy pogos for a yeah. 20 actually were productive and getting the tendon to actually store energy because that's a trainable thing, man. Like one I've given a presentation on this before of just trying to further explain the muscle tendon unit and just this pretty crazy relationship between the muscle and the tendon and who does what like because like, we just kind of assume the tendon is always storing energy but it's just not always the case like the tendon is not always you know playing that role depending on the intensity of the movement like if the muscle is really doing its job to just be like as tense as a rock the tendon is going to store a lot of energy and you're going to get a lot of output doing that and there's some kids that just have not trained that they they can't do a cartwheel they can't do right they can't bounce they can't jump they just never had to do that so the ones that like, hey, if I'm a little bit more, like an approach jump, for example. Mm -hmm. Like we had a kid at, at Corpus Christi, John Jordan, he's still playing, uh, he's playing in Africa right now. He's an amazing athlete. Uh, he did gymnastics most of his life growing up and he was a really good basketball player. His standing vertical was a 38, his approach was a 50. Like, oh my he's, won, Lord he's on Duncan Demix, you know, like Jeez. he's won the G League done contest. Oh my God. With the 905 Raptors and stuff. and. Till this day, the most athletic individual I've ever worked with. And he's 5'10 and just a human oh spring, dude. God. I mean, you just That's look wild. at him. I mean, but like from a standing 38, which is already really impressive. Right. Tim at the 35 today. 35.4 you know, so Three people. inches away from John Jordan. Ladies like, and gentlemen. On an approach, which our approach yeah. is like the same. So it's kind of disappointing. Yeah. He's wow. adding 12 wow. more inches on just his ability to just store all that energy and be just incredibly like intentional about that horizontal energy going to that vertical energy. And it's like... It's the tendons, man. And guess who had the worst mobility on campus? John Jordan. Yeah. I mean, yeah. His ankles were just locked down, just stiff. But man, man he was, was he springy. springy. And it's like, you know, like we we'd go and play uh um Georgetown. He posterized the dude, like and it was all over his sports center top ten, like and and we're playing at St. Louis, the Billikens won that game, and he posterized another dude there, and he's 5'10", like just, just dunking on people. It'd be so and fun. it's like, so fun. I know, I'd like every every day, I was like, what's it like to be like you, man? <laughs> like, I'm just gonna jump over stuff all the it's time. All right. But I, I've noticed that with athletes who fall into that elastic, you know, um, bucket more so than, than others, there's usually a pretty significant discrepancy between a counter movement vertical jump like yep. that and their approach jump. And it's one of those things, like when you see it, you go, Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And then you ask what they did in their childhood, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like usually like, it's like, oh yeah, I did gymnastics or like I did, 
I like to, you know, I just put the rim on eight. I put the rim on eight feet and dunked on my little brother every day in the driveway. That one kid who I just saw on on Instagram, like the one kid that like kissed the rim in his his kitchen, like he was like nine years old, just doing windmills. Bro, that was me. Now, I, you know, years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But he's like, and that was like a little mini hoop and he's just like flashy doing all the stuff. And now it's like, look where he's at now. I don't know how old he is now, but it was like, dude, he's like, so gifted as a dunker well that's he did that his entire life and that's what we're talking about with some of these linemen that have never done anything like that it's like we're trying to overcome 15 years of just sitting around you know and just being the the big kid Mm -hmm. just because like you know they didn't they weren't very good at these other things that doesn't mean you shouldn't do them like get your butt out there and play some pickup basketball go play some tennis like go jump rope, you know, do something like do these other activities that compound themselves over the course between age 15 and 18. And then when you get to college, you might be playing at a D2 as a lineman just because you don't have that same quickness. You got the size, but dude, that's, that's the difference between two college scholarships between two 300 pound kids. It's like, it's, it's really reactivity and like stiffness because like bench press only gets you so far too. Like you still got to go from point A to point B, you know, as, as a lineman. And so that's just like, something I really try to get our linemen to prioritize. And it's almost always the biggest indention on the profile. That's, but the ones that walk in, like Lee's oldest son, Brody, he's got like a 4 RSI and he's about 260, 270. So if that tells you anything, I mean, yeah, he's yeah, just like, he's, he's got all the offers for a reason. I mean, yeah. like he can just move, like his feet are just, you know. I think the biggest the differentiator, I mean, when we were growing up playing football, everyone was concerned how much you weighed. But like more and more college coaches I talk to, like if you're not quick and fast, like they can put weight on you. That's not exactly. hard at all. Yeah. But if you aren't quick and fast, good luck. Like you're not going to yeah. go to probably. And they just kind of just give up to. on them. You yeah. Know, yeah. Just yeah. Like, well, yeah. Let's get on the line or like everybody else is going to bound, but you're not, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, they still need to bound. They still need to do plyos. It's just, it's just different. Like it's mm-hmm. a regressed version, just like anything else. And like uh, we've now like, you know, we're like a safe haven for for big kids. You know, for fat kids. Because like, <laughs> like we, we we attract a lot of those. Lee was a you know, a blocking tight end, and all of our combine guys, ninety percent of them are are linemen. Typically, we just we just almost could speak their language a little bit better and yep. just like regress them to the point where they we can get you really stinking fast. And we had a center for Illinois run a four nine. He was the fastest Jesus. center at the you know in his pro day. So and then we had a guy. How named, much did he weigh? 305, like right at 300. <sighs> yeah, beat so, me twice my body weight. Yeah. I mean, oh. you have to run 20 ish miles an hour to be able to run that fast. And he did. And so he was like a 5'2, five, 5'3 five, when he got to us. But it's like for four or five years at Illinois, he didn't actually do a lot of like true speed training like the skill yeah. guys did. And understandably so. Like they just kind of prioritize other things. But mm-hmm. it's honestly easier sometimes. I was talking to Zach about this, like getting somebody who hadn't had that stimulus very much, like with the 40, to, to shave it down a pretty significant amount versus yep. like the bench press. Like the bench press is one of the hardest things in combine training to improve on because their upper bodies are just so shot already from just being a lineman. But you know, the 40, you can you can shave that down pretty good. And a lot of it's just that stimulus that you just ease up into and we're bounding and we're single leg bounding and they hate it for the mm-hmm. most part, but it's extremely effective, man. Yeah, for I mean, it's a bucket building they didn't speed. hit. What, uh, we were talking about force plates earlier. You said there's six or seven metrics you look at on the force plate. Yep. You, can yep. you dive into that? So one jump is really all you need. I mean, we'll do like counter movement, your, jump. Yeah, counter movement yeah. jump. I actually was kind of conflicted with hands on hips, free, or actually, so we w- have a dowel on the back. Okay. And I've okay. just found that that actually orients the body so well for a kid that isn't as a skilled of a, of a jumper because counter movement jumps is for sure a skill. Yeah. There's like the kipping of the knee, the feet and the arching. The stick actually encourages you with focusing on your legs to truly drive vertically as much as possible, like you're extending into it. So so I adopted that kind of uh, part of the protocol. Uh, and then we prioritize height for obvious reasons, because if everything in a perfect world, I'd do this jump really, really well, then height's going to be the thing that goes up. And that's usually the end all be all. Like you could just take that and be cool with it, which is why with the plyo mat, I'm like, do we even really need force plates to do this? But the force plates really give you a deeper look with, you know, looking at MRSI, which is essentially like how much counter movement did I need to get this height? Ah. And so like, does that help you 
train athletes differently? Like if you see they need less knee bend or more knee bend, are they more forced? That one's interesting, dominant? man. Because I, I, uh, short answer is no, because I just, it's, it's such a strategy thing, yeah. right? Like some athletes, sure. I'll, I'll watch them and I love just kind of watching how they all jump, right? Yeah. Like, and there's some kids that they'll literally bend their knees this much and yeah. they're hitting a, a 20 inches, right? Mm -hmm. And then my first thought is like, holy crap, like that's awesome. They're just so fast with that eccentric rate of force development that the tendons can get stretched and they boom and hit it. And yeah, they're just so it. focused on the concentric side of, of driving through the legs that they can hit the height. So for those kids, I'll just in the moment, like, hey man, squat a little deeper and see what happens. And then I look at the screen and then what if it's, if it's worse, then why, and why am I trying to drive them into that, you Position. know, way of jumping necessarily mm -hmm. because in my experience is primarily being a court sport strength coach with volleyball, tennis, and basketball. Volleyball middles, you really shouldn't care about what their vert is. Like at the end of the day, like if you could, like I'm going to the UT, you know, game tonight or the match tonight, and I'm guarantee you like one middle in, in the course of a rally will go up for a block or even just kind of like pretend and fake, you know, like a, a swing nine to 10 times in like one series. And it's like sometimes in two or three rallies, she's not jumping as high as she can. It's more about getting off the ground quickly so that I can even be in the right place to make this block. Cause offensive schemes in volleyball are so complex. You actually don't even know where you're actually gonna need to go. Where's the setter even gonna set it left or right. And I just gotta get there and get my hands up. So in my experience, the girls that um, were our best middles were really lean, really elastic, and they didn't have the, like these super high verticals, but it didn't really matter because they were just exactly where they needed to be right away and they jumped high enough. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so like, I, why would I coach that girl to, to take a massive counter movement that it's like something she'll never do in volleyball? Like it's totally absent. I mean, she could probably benefit from some deep tier stuff just from tendon health and like strength and those kinds of things, but I'm not gonna tell her this is how you should jump because like all you need is that quick in and out. Same with getting a rebound. Like you don't have all day to get up and get a rebound. No. You have milliseconds, you know? So why are we encouraging athletes to do these big landings and these big counter movements? Cause I don't, it's depending on how the athletes wired and engineered may actually not produce a higher jump anyway. So, but then I have the kids that are very, like the swimmers. Swimmers will literally go all but the way, the they'll heels, melt yeah. to the ground. And then, because that's where they feel like they can get the most leverage. And, and then, I, so I let them do their thing with that too. It's like, I don't know that there is a right or wrong strategy, but it's extremely interesting to see you just, it, it really comes down to elastic and force. You actually see that with the oh, kind yeah. of movement well, that's, what, that's what I was kind of alluding to of like, your more muscularly driven athletes are probably getting way lower on their yep. jump. And it's cool to see same two different athletes organize in a different way and get mm -hmm. the same output yep. with like the two inch knee bend or the butt on your heels. Um, and obviously some are advantageous for other sports yep. and mm -hmm. not for others. And I think um, that's just what people need to understand. Like, you know, having been trained so many different sports, it's like, man, there really is not a whole lot of just cookie cutter answers or solutions no, for sucks. <laughs> some of these drills. Yeah, it's, and it's, you, you want things to be simple and we try so hard, but at the end of the day, like it's not, that easy and so you know when i watch these kids do these metrics like i still will prioritize i still will look at mrsi um because the ones that do have that really deep kind of counter movement still can jump extremely high so it's still a decent score but i don't score that one i just look at it and i put it on the sheet so they can kind of see it but the two that i do score are relative breaking net impulse and relative propulsive net impulse and it's basically like how much force am i creating through time uh, relative to my body weight. And that's usually pretty telling. And this is what like, I'm not a thousand percent sold on it. I'm still having conversations with people smarter than me, but breaking relative net, net impulse means I'm pretty good at squatting. Like I'm pretty good at the RDLs, the posterior chain split squats. Like I can, I can bend and I can be compliant. I can create a lot of energy downwards, right? Like I'm, I'm recruiting a lot of force kind of eccentrically. Whereas Propulsive net impulse, those are the kids that probably really love deadlifts and cleans. Like they can just extend. They're they're good jumpers. They're hitting, you know, pretty high on a plyo mat. They can extend all the energy and carry it out. And so those two aren't always it's so it's a little different than just elastic and muscular. Like this mm -hmm. is now a kind of a, an issue of strength one way or the other. Yeah. And so I I'm not quite going as far as saying if my propulsive is super low, then we're not going to squat. We're just going to mostly do, you know, deadlifts or like pulls or something like that. But with my combine guys, I am like, that's, it, it needs to be addressed when some of them, man, like 
the vertical actually determines whether or not they maybe get paid a little bit more in the league or For drafted. Sure. So like, and if like you're great on over here, we're just going to do a frick ton of like push presses and med ball throws for distance. And it, it's, a lot of it's just displacement based activities, yeah. pulls, nothing where I actually have to focus so much on catching something, but I'm just trying to send something away, like just extend it fully. Um, that should, in theory, increase the propulsive side, which in theory should make their jump better because that's what's kind of lacking. I think so. like volleyball is a great example that you alluded with the middle is like reactive like crazy and then your outsides are more, mm -hmm. more like timing and everything like that. Um, would you lean into that and be like, okay, you're going to do, if you're an outside, since it's timing, you're going to do more long duration stuff when we're in season or whatever. And then or my middle, we're going to be more reactive. Mm -hmm. How would you marry those together? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Your outside is definitely like a vertical jump big time matters. Mm -hmm. you know, I was over at the Olympic uh, side with Donnie a little bit ago. And Do you watch them practice at all? Some of those I didn't, women can um, jump out of oh, the yeah. gym. Well, that's what I was about to say. The like, gym. There's like this plaques on the wall of like the record for highest touch. Yeah. And there was 11 feet was yeah. how high one of the girls had touched. And and in volleyball, like touching ten is already like, man, we got we got ten foot jumpers. And every yeah. volleyball sport coach in the country, when they go and recruit, that's, ten, standard, ten, that's, that's the standard. Yeah, yeah. Touching yep. ten, touching yeah. ten, six, holy crap. Yeah. Like yeah. so yes, height absolutely matters because then that determines the angle that the ball can actually uh, enter the other court. Like, you know, Nico Iamaliava, who's was a really go good balls. go balls again. Uh, <laughs> he uh, you know, when you watch his like volleyball highlights and Nasty. men's volleyball is like Donk. Like He's it's just it goes the down. ball straight down. Men's volleyball is very fun to watch. Yeah, it it is, is, yeah. Like everyone thinks basketball players are the highest jumpers, which yeah. the, I mean they're very elite jumpers, but men's volleyball, yeah, like outside well, hitters, guys got like right 40 side. plus verts <laughs> it's on insane. everybody. It's, it's disgusting. Yeah. yeah. And and the force that they're hitting that ball straight down oh, with. Yeah. 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 So as far as like a plyometric program, I would for sure consider that. And it's like, do I need a more kind of compliant type approach to plyos maybe some you know like really if you're taking matt's model for how he structures like ping tier and deep tier stuff like that could that could be the simple application for that what it was always funny for me was like what do i do with the back row players yeah for like, sure it's it was always like know. all right you know i'm really excited about these rsis and this stuff yeah. from all my front row girls and the back row girls are just like oh let's broad jump you know yeah. let's just because for them they absolutely have to be extremely flexible and explosive. And so quick feet, but also very bendy mm -hmm. because they're in these crazy positions to pancake a ball and to just get so low to the earth. Their job is to be low. Almost for them, those mobility flexibility scores would be higher on the priority than a yes. middle or an outside. No question. And that's what I for found. safety for sure. Yeah. And like, the, and we also started a beach volleyball team while I was at Corpus Christi and we didn't have the money to go and scholarship beach players like outright. Like now it's like you can get just Texas, yeah, Texas beach just, teams. Oh yeah, they just they launched just it. it. Yeah. They, they, they robbed uh, UCLA's long-term. Nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, good. It's good on them. Bamboozle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The old, no. old fashioned Texas <laughs> swindle. <laughs> yeah. Got him. Sleight of hand. <laughs> Got him. Yeah. Well, I bring that up because we actually had our indoor players trying to play beach. Oh yeah, it's something and it was, to watch. It was it was it was borderline hilarious. Like when you yeah. have our middles who are like, all they've ever done is you know run you know run in the front row and block. Like they don't get down to the floor. Like they just don't need to. Like in some instances they do. And so here they are trying to you know play beach and they literally can't. Like just don't have just the cannot. physical qualities to, yeah. uh, to be as good. I mean they were they were good because volleyball's volleyball still, but they're not setting as much. They're not doing these other things. So. So yeah, man, I mean, you can really dive into, and Donnie does, like with position specific, anything. I mean, like volleyball, what's cool about it is, is they're very different. These girls yes. look entirely different from each other. You know, your middles, your right sides, you know, your back row players. And um, what I've noticed though about college is like the girls who end up playing back row in college also probably played outside in high school too. So they they can kind of do everything and uh, they're springy, but at the end of the day, mobility is, is definitely mm -hmm. a, a more important quality for, for that sport. Uh, whereas basketball, I'm a little partial to basketball. I think it's the greatest sport of all time. Preach. In terms of true <laughs> athleticism, because you're playing offense, you're playing defense. You gotta it's, do it all, Tim. You can't just, you know, don't wanna hit people, play offense, <laughs> can't catch, play defense. I'm yeah. just joking. Yeah, I'm a little partial to it, man, because there's just so many things that go into being successful as a basketball player. Just so many qualities, skill, 
physical. And so it's just a lot of fun because you almost can't do any wrong with training some of those athletes who mm -hmm. just need everything. They yep. just literally need yep. to be good at everything. You know, they need to be flexible. They need to be springy. They need just, all of it. Just, Endurance. Like I got a question with basketball. Yep. So this happens on the men's side a lot. Everyone wants, you know, you get a skinny high schooler. We need to put on weight. Mm -hmm. What have you seen upper body mass do to a vertical jump or RSI? That's a good question. Um, I'm thinking of a kid right now, basketball player, six six, um, gained five ten pounds of muscle. His horsepower went up in every possible way. He's faster, springier. So I haven't quite seen a negative with a sixteen year old, you know, in that regard where weight hurt them. So to answer your question. Uh, usually when a 15, 16, 17 year old is gaining mass, it is in all the right places. Yeah. You know, it's, it's where it needs to be. And, but if you're not measuring those things, then yeah, maybe it is the dirty bulk, you know, like mm -hmm. not, not, <laughs> you know, being applied, um, to the areas of performance, but you know, that's, that's what the weight room takes care of, man. Like, and like, if all you do is curls and, and gain five pounds on that, then maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe you're not seeing much progress there, but. I'm always interested to see like what's the upper limit on players of what if they get too heavy like post players when is it better or worse thing yeah. um and I'm sure you see that football all the time like at what point did you put on the the boat go way too well and you're way too big you know you're <laughs> yeah. not agile or can't yeah. move anymore yeah and you know take take a, a look at like Jokic or some of these guys that like you probably could be like oh you're, you're on the cusp, buddy. You know, yeah, like, yeah. So they're gaining any more pounds than that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Running up and down the court is a little hard for you right now. Yeah. You know, watch we can it. tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure there is a cutoff for yeah. those guys who can gain weight. Um, Richard, we're coming up on time. We've got some segments. Okay. Um, you want me to go first? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, this segment is called Three Things, brought to you by Squat Wedgies. Use code COACHEMUP15 for 15% 15 off at checkout. Richard, what are three things that someone can do to get to where you are today? Professionally speaking? Like Professionally speaking, yes. Well, treat people extremely well show them how much you care and, and love them as people. Everybody who had, had been responsible for promoting me or hiring me saw that quality and was like, he really cares. And like, and he cares about me and, and he cares about my athletes. So, you know, not allowing other things to detract from that and being very self-aware to where you're not sending the wrong message either. It's like, man, I, I really do care. And, you know, some people that's a, that's a big hill to climb for, you know, for whatever it is they're, they're going through. Second thing I would just say is hang around with uh, other people that have already been there, you know, smart people like Donnie Mabe, you know, like I, any chance I get, man, I'm just going to hang around him and just, you know, listen to him, just listen, you know, mm -hmm. and ask questions. And, you know, that inquisitive approach to to your 20s where you're conflicted of like, I feel like I should know these answers, you know, because I'm trying to prove my worth you're always trying to it's a proving ground like i'm sure. really good at what I'm i smart. do but it's like you don't know really yeah. hardly anything so it really is a healthy balance of like being extremely confident and being able to do your job but also and bold in that but also being like humble and inquisitive to know that like there's still so much growing to do and that that, that, that balance absolutely helped me get to where where i am and then i guess last thing is you know just being willing to to sacrifice a lot in what I call the grind years, you know, like I, I always laugh when I have interns or like part time coaches that are like, coach, I'm going to go on vacation for a week. And, you know, it's and part of it's like, that's awesome, like that you can a afford that. Yeah, I go and do that with yeah. the family. But Ow. I'm also like, like, man, these are the grind years, dude. Like this is this is when it is that proven ground. And like every moment you have to grow. I'm, I'm not anti vacation for being in your 20s, but <laughs> You know, when I when I see kids just don't understand really the sacrifice that it takes to be in this profession. I again, I can't speak to a normal nine to five, you know, uh, engineer that that gets paid by the hour. I'm speaking to like high level athletics, and it's like it's just different, man. And I had this conversation with with Anna and even Katie, who's a uh, an intern over there, and it's and I'm and I basically gave her this exact same speech. It's like. Like if this is truly what you love, then you, there's there's going to be a tremendous amount of sacrifice involved. But you also have to remind yourself of like why you do it. Like uh, I texted Mike Mike Boyle and I got into a 
a little bit of a, an exchange on Twitter. <laughs> who, uh, Weird. Yeah. And, and, it, but it was like, a, I, I didn't really expect him. <laughs> Actually, this is what happened. Tight. Y'all need to get let, this, let yeah. the show with this one. Yeah. Y'all need to get boy on the podcast too, but he, and he would love to, but I had just like, there, there was my alma mater, Corpus Christi is hiring. The head baseball coach texted me. He's like, hey, please help us get somebody good. And I'm like, absolutely. I love that place. I love Coach Malone. He was one of my, he named me Rich. You know, he, nice. gave me the, he created the Rich <laughs> persona. And and so immediately, like, you know, you, when you're trying to help people find a, a quality individual, you start, you know, texting high, high network people. And, and Boyle, I texted them and I said, here's a position, here's what it pays. And he's like, that'd be a really good tweet. And then he like, next thing I know, he's tweeting that uh, college athletics, you know, it, nobody wants to do it anymore because it's so underpaid and oh, you're yeah, Here you are trying to get a and job. Like, yeah, <laughs> really. Mike, you know, help it's me out. It's the opposite, Mike. <laughs> it's the wrong That's guy. young gun, yeah, kid. To and get then, then we get into it and I'm like, ah. and then I And then I immediately tweeted under like, well, you know, you have to really love it. And I'm just trying to like advocate for it because yeah, man, like college athletics is extremely demanding, you know, yeah. and and all high performance is that way. I mean, ask any Olympian that, you know, is uh, like their banners up in, in the Texas weight room right now because of all the things that were a sacrifice to them. And, and sure, there's not a lot of money involved. So it, it just comes down to why you do what you do. And it's like, it was hard on my family, man. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be honest. And that's why I've made the transitions that I've had, but, yeah. but I would go back to college athletics in a heartbeat for those reasons, like I, I, it's not like I'm yearning to go back to that, but the feeling of, of get, you know, team and culture. And it's this, awesome. It's the, the teamwork aspect of it is unmatched, man. And it's one of the greatest experiences you can have in a healthy environment where everybody truly is working together and everybody's sacrificing. So like you're kind of measuring stick with each other is like how much you sacrifice. Because if I see you stepping up and caring this much, then I'm going to step up and care this much. And that's just such a beautiful thing to take place. And that's, that's what college athletics, sure you're underpaid and overworked, but I mean, you know, I, I would never trade any of those experiences in for more money ever you know it was just it was kind of worth it and um and i and i just my advice to the young strength coaches who just expect to get paid whatever you know a certain amount by a certain time it's like i mean you just got to trust that it's going to come like you just kind of have to keep being the, the two things that i had mentioned before and just being willing to to just show that you're as committed as everybody else around you and then that's contagious you know what i'm saying so you know, Mike Boyle, like he, he kind of views it as 30 years at, at, you know, Boston, you know, university and like, and just, and, and where he is now and how successful he is from the business side and everything. Sure. Like, it's a great take of like college athletics didn't necessarily help me get to where I'm at. Like I've, I've shifted to now have the success that he's had, but we all define success differently. So it's just kind of, I view relationships and college athletics. That's my asset. Like those are the things that I hold dear, you know, in my life. So um, yeah, man, it's it's a fun conversation to have, and I'll always be pro college athletics. Like, it's just, it's awesome, man. There's nothing like it. So don't be scared. Don't be scared of the sacrifices do and, it. The, and the low pay. Yeah, yeah. You know, live on and be homeless. You yeah, know, it's, it's cool <laughs> to be poor when you're in your twenties. Yeah. Ramen. Cool. You know, your health doesn't matter. Yeah. No, like, it is. It's a hard sell for sure. For, yeah, for young people. Yeah, if you, yeah, it's fun. Do it. Just do it. Next segment is brought to you by Plyomat. Hey! Have you, Rich, have you ever used a Plyomat? I have today, actually. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We have yeah. one in our weight room, and it's the best damn Plyomat on the planet. Uh, the Ours was kind of messed up today. The numbers were skewed. Yeah. Can you go into that? I had the lowest vertical by a, a, a lot. Well, yeah. see, that's funny, because I thought the numbers were right, because... All right, next really segment. High. Next <laughs> segment. <laughs> we should have recalibrated. Yeah. You know. We're uh, Tim's turning me into an athlete over the next couple of months, so stay tuned. That number's about to go up. Hell yeah. Go, baby. Uh, Plow Matt, coach him up five for 5% off. It's a big discount. Big you discount for the best really Plow Matt on the planet. It's, yeah, Absolutely. we use it every day. Get one. Rant, rave, anything you want. Let's just say in the industry. Okay. Rant about the industry, and then let's pancake it with some nice thoughts. Rant. All right. I think the Instagram world, which benefits a lot of us in a lot of ways, it's pretty awesome. Um, we're losing our ability to dive deep into anything. It's more width over depth, you mm. know, and some of the best advice I'd ever received as a 
young swing coach with imposter syndrome, feeling like I got to be good at all these things. You're so overwhelmed by shallow knowledge of a bunch of subjects that you don't get into deep knowledge of, of, of like, let me just invest in one thing at a time. So man, like it's so confusing right now to be a young professional, and even in the fitness world, like if we're not, we're, we're getting, totally. we've been really heavy on strength and conditioning on this, on this episode, but like even in the fitness world, like my wife just started a, uh, a, a, a like a vegetable only like kind of fast and like she and then she hoping that it was going to turn out to be a positive thing. she feels terrible now so right, it's just yeah. like and like yep. but she was convinced like that like this is the this is the way to go for nutrition and this i mean it's just so stinking confusing and convoluted mm -hmm. um to where if we just all read a book you know <laughs> and like true like and it's hard like is it like you got your phone and I'm, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, man, because like I was I was really good about pre Instagram world of getting all of my information from books like it was just normal. Like if you want to learn something, you go to a conference and you read a book and then you know, like I read Supple Leopard in two days. Like I just couldn't yeah. put it down. Like it was I mean, yeah. this was 10 years ago. Blew my mind. I had it on the floor in the living room and I'm like just doing all the things. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh huh. Yeah. No. And so like but then, you, you know, you look at this and you're like, oh, that's a cool drill. And you're looking at all these different drills. But for the young professional that like had not doesn't have a library at their house of like books that they've read before and and questions that they've asked and certifications that they've taken like it's we're not helping ourselves like our profession is needs to be better about you know kind of going back to like let's have a few governing bodies of of associations to help drive this thing but like the CSCCA and the NSCA the NHSCA are all struggling this uphill battle because people would rather just be on social media than go to an actual conference or mm -hmm. like network there. And so they're just, you know, financially probably struggling to get the amount of attendance to keep the profession growing and to have the platform and stage. So, you know, if anything, like with however many views this gets, it's like just being an advocate for let's still protect like the people that should be uh, and are uh, educating in the, in the right way, you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. like with research and when I, I think um, Ramsey and Najem, Ram at, and now at Kansas, I think like he is a breath of fresh air for me because he is so evidence-based and is such an advocate for evidence-based evidence practice. I went through his cohort recently and it was so refreshing for me. I'm like, man, we're digging into some stuff. Like we're, we're actually like, I don't know, like did, what would happen if I did, you know, this modality versus that one? Well, actually somebody did that in the lab. And so it, we're just getting, naturally away from it and I, I just feel like man we got it's up to us really to be advocates for bringing point pe pointing people back into uh you know recommending becoming a supple leopard to the viewers of this you know deal who want to learn more about mobility go read that book like absolutely if you have never read that book like go enlighten yourself and read that so that would be my rant shallow education of of the modern times I like, I like, you agree, Zach? Well, I actually went on a rant today to my uh, assistants about this because um, I think we get comments and DMs all the time and these base level, surface level questions that honestly, a quick Google search, you could figure it out. No. And then I think the mass amount of education you have now of like YouTube videos, conferences, there's a lot, all these a lot things. Of good stuff. Yeah. And it's like, how about you take the day, you know, and if you have a question about isometrics, like mm -hmm. there's five to 10 experts we know that most people follow, listen to their presentations online, read their books, read their articles, like dive into it before you just want the quick yeah, depth versus answer. width. Yeah, yeah, percent. exactly. And so it's like, you actually have to invest in yourself and take some time out of your day to, like you said, like open up a book and yeah. read it. Absolutely. Yeah. Reading, reading rainbow. Let's bring back reading rainbow. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Come on. Hey, what, a, okay. So what's your rave? Rave. Uh, what well, are you loving right now? Um, Whataburger. Number one. I nice. gotta, I gotta find a Whataburger after this and get me like, I just, I saw somebody like a neighbor of my brother who just moved to Knoxville wearing a Whataburger shirt. I'm like, how do I not have a Whataburger shirt? <laughs> now I mean, rave would be, I don't know if I stick with the you know the professional approach or not, but um, I'll I give think you two raves. Two raves. Two raves. Okay. Uh, First two time raver. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, what an honor. Can we have well, a rave I in mean, here? The we, segment yeah. is yeah. Is the brought, lights do cool this, stuff. This segment is brought to you by you. So <laughs> you make the rules. Totally rule. fair. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, uh, I actually got seven yeah. raves. Yeah. 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 I mean, how <laughs> much time do we got? Yeah. Uh, no, man. I think. 
you know, my rave would be, you know, all the all the the coaches and teachers out there, you know, who don't have a platform and who aren't getting recognition and like the teachers and because I I was one, I was at a really healthy private school. Where I was able to kind of have a platform and do some cool stuff. But there's a lot of unsung heroes, man, of the high school strength conditioning world. And so if I can rave towards any one of them, the, one of the best things I ever did for myself professionally was immerse myself in high school strength conditioning because there are incredible people in Minnesota and in Indiana who you would never meet because I don't really have a platform who are like serving kids like all day long and are really freaking good coaches. Like they're Hell yeah. incredibly intelligent, really gifted, good family people. Like, and it's just like, they deserve so much more recognition, but you would not even know who they are unless you went to like the NHS SCA, National High School Strength Coaches Association, which is now, going on eight years of existence and man like there's 250 300 people that attend that conference and even for a college strength coach to, to attend something like that and be a part of it like you would have so much more appreciation for um the level of development that's that's happening now more than ever at the high school setting and 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 rave number two i guess would be and kind of just like an eye-opening thing for me freshmen are no longer just like freshmen anymore like coming into college and this is like I'll use just an example of of a kid who I didn't mention, like with Mar our assessment program at, at, at Triple F. Same as I had at GEC, there was a scoring system. Mm -hmm. It was like Call of Duty leveling up and you know and earning all these kind of accolades, like of foundation, fit, fortified, fast, and freak. And I had to create another category for a couple of kids that were just so exceptional. We called it the Monster Program because yeah. uh, Gary's from Boston and he was monsters. <laughs> and so that was his thing. And so like, like I literally had these kids were so outside. They were outliers performance wise. And one of them, as a freshman at UNC, ended up starting as a safety in the ACC championship game. Whoa. Like as a freshman. Dang. Like so. Like my point is, and we're at Boo Carter at Tennessee, and just the freak he is, and just like freak freshmen aren't just freshmen anymore man like if you like take a moment college student coaches out there to just call like uh, like reach out to the high school that they came from you might be like just blown away by the, the movements that you're like expecting them to struggle with coming into day one there's always like that freshman program it's like all right goblet squats for you uh -huh. you know whereas meanwhile this one kid that i trained could rear fit elevated split squat 405 God, you know like I started you yeah. know as an 18 year old so i mean so why are we then regressing him for from a, for an arbitrary reason just because he's a freshman he's been doing this stuff since he was 12 like dude i've i've trained he was the coach's son since he was 12 13 years old so like in the same way that we're advocating for middle school and high school to be so much better which it is now i mean just got to open your eyes and there's a whole world of, of great programs out there that are doing really good jobs. Brad Fortney and uh, in Alabama, Enterprise Alabama, ordered eight plyo mats to, to go to some <laughs> elementary schools. And so, like, there's elementary schools that are, like, doing A skips and B skips and bounds. Like, like there's, I mean, there's some really good stuff happening go. where, like, by the time they get to where they're at, they're yes, they were already skilled stuff, enough. But, yeah. they, I mean, they've been, sometimes they've been doing this for, like, a really long time and they're really good at it. Let's not just assume that all freshmen are the same anymore. But, you know, you could still be cautious and, and probably think that, especially because female athletics is a little bit further behind, it's still taboo for a lot of girls to come to a place like Collective or Triple F and invest in themselves. Um, I don't know why, but like, you know, I want to be a huge advocate for for young female athletes to take their journey so seriously that they're training the same way that the boys are, you know? and. And if they do that, then by the time they get to college, they're just going to crush it. Like they're going to be so far ahead of anything that you're having the girls do because they just have been doing it already. Well, know? I noticed the other day we were talking with my assistants and they were talking about how the f last two freshman classes have been really good. And this whole time I'm like, yeah, I'm a damn good coach. And I was like, wait, no, they're getting such good development Before coming up. That, like yeah. I didn't, because I, I remember- Make I was your job like, really easy. Yeah, I was sure. like, I didn't have to do any of this remedial stuff with them because they could come in like first day and do stuff. And I was like, wow, like that speaks to the, what's going on at the lower levels. It's, like it's, it's awesome. It's good, man. And there's a lot of good ones out there. And again, like they just don't, you wouldn't know about it because yeah. they're probably not on social media and they don't have a big following. But but the kids know. The kids yeah. will, they'll talk to you about their strength coach. Like yeah. they'll, they'll always remember- you know, what they sacrificed and devoted for them. And, um, and yeah, man, that's a huge plug for the people out there that are just uh, doing things for the right reasons. Serving kids are way underpaid and way overworked, but they're driving our profession in the right direction for sure. 
Um, last segment. This is called unsolicited solicited advice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is brought to you by Amaze Fit and this sweet T Rex watch. It's literally named after a dinosaur, guys. That's all I need to say. Best damn watch I've ever worn. Um, unsolicited solicited advice. Code. So, oh, guys. I forgot. Yeah, Thank we got you. a code now. We have a code. And it's, dude, it's, it's how much percent off? It's 15%, 15%. off. 15%. Jesus, yeah. that's amazing. Guys, the code is, ama- go to amazefit.com, enter in the promo code, coach them up. That's it. No number, no nothing. Just coach them up. You get 15% off a watch that's already an incredible deal. It's the best watch you ever had. It's named after a dinosaur. That's yeah, all I'm anything, just going to say that. Anything site-wide. Forever. Anything site-wide is 50% off. The ring. What? Any of the watches. Yeah. They they hooked it up. I'm reading the ad. They How did I not know this? The they whole website is 15% off. Amazefit.com. Amazefit.com. Everything's 15% off code. Coach them up. Um, wow. I, I felt know. like we scripted that. But yeah, huge news <laughs> though. Yeah, <huge laughs> that was news. actually not scripted. <laughs> One of my friends bought a ring. He's like, dude, the code worked. I was like, tight. Let's it go. It does? The <laughs> code works? Yeah, code works. Um, okay, anyway, back to the segment. Uh, Richard, thank you for being patient with us. Sure. Unsolicited, solicited advice. Okay, so... Um, you know, you've been with here with us a while. You're going to a volleyball game later tonight. You say to yourself, I'm going to go get a Whataburger shirt and I'm going to go to work at Whataburger exactly. and get a burger yeah. as well. Uh, you decide to walk in and uh, you're standing in line and uh, someone comes and stands behind uh, in line right behind you. And they're standing a little too close. <laughs> now, instead of, you know, checking them or anything like that, <laughs> you, you said, you know what, now is a perfect time for me to tell this person whose breath I can feel on my neck, <laughs> this piece of advice. What piece of advice would you give this strange man breathing on your neck in Whataburger? Well, the fact that he's in Whataburger is, uh, is a good start. You know, it's yeah. my people. Yes. Um, for sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, a man of the people. For my people. Hot breath. Yeah. You know, blue collar, you know, <laughs> just like good old orange and white Whataburger, <laughs> baby. Uh, honestly, man, like, I mean, my faith is just so important to me. And, and I just attribute my entire career and all this conversation we've had to just submitting to God's ultimate will for my life. So I would just encourage that person to be like, man, like pray, you know, just seek out your, your maker. And if chances are you're feeling lost kind of right now in this moment, I would hope that in that process of submission and praying that you feel found and feel purposeful. So I think that's that. wonderful advice. And then also, are you, are you, after you say this, are you gonna then ask him to back up, or is or is this, or do you give him a hug? I'll here? probably buy him his burger. Here we go. Let's bring him go. go. Which is so funny. I have a weird just memory to share. One time I was twelve years old. My cousin was in Lawton, Oklahoma. Have you ever been to Lawton, Oklahoma? No. Lawton, Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> they and he was in a, a tough man fight, and mm-hmm. it was like he was in the military. I was that like, checks out. Weird. Hell yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 What were you doing in yeah. uh, It was like this, this old janky arena, and I'm watching my cousin <laughs> fight somebody, you know. And it's like <laughs> it was like on FX, and it was just wild. And I Hell was twelve, yeah, dude. And we leave, and it's like two a.m. And again, I'm twelve years old. <laughs> and actually, no, I was probably like 13, but 13, 14, something like that. And we're sitting in a Whataburger in Lawton, Oklahoma. It is a Whataburger. And there is somebody way too close to me sitting. And I think she was on drugs, but she turned around and, and did this to the back of my head. Just started poking <laughs> the back of my head. And I'm just this kid. And I, like, for whatever reason, man, that like was... I don't know if trauma is the right word, but just an experience of just like, I, Unforgettable. Get, like, I am scared, but yes. I would have said what I told you now to her. And maybe that would have been like changing, Seriously, but changed her life. At she the probably the day, at the very least would have stopped poking you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Never been poked in the head before, but you know, <laughs> that, and it was like almost no verbal interaction, just some poking in the back of the head. Nice. So, yeah, it was a, a good time. Nothing but, like getting touched by an right. unhoused <laughs> drug, uh, dr- uh, drug addicted yeah, person after a fist fight drugs. in uh, the middle of nowhere Oklahoma <laughs> this this whole story actually adds up it does I, just want to I know you're not lying yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no <laughs> that was real that's a real story yeah can't for sure but it is Whataburger and you talked about somebody being way too close to me so it kind of brought up a <laughs> experience you know <laughs> Richard um <clears throat> where can people find you where can people interact with you and where can people find Plymouth yeah, so Plyomat, Plyomat.com. We bought the domain. So Hell we were, yeah. we were just dot net when we were small business. Now we're big time. So Hell yeah. Dot com, dot com boy. Dot com Shout guy. out dot coms everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are you sure we need this? And so yeah, we got the dot com. Um, and then Triple F, you know, there's, it's triple is where you can find all things about kind of what we do in our system and structure. But 
most of my social media kind of tags are rich underscore triple F. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man, email rich at triple F Knoxville.com or Richard. I don't Richard. know why I decided to separate rich and Richard when it came to Plyomat, but it's Richard at Plyomat.net. And yeah, I would love to, to interact with anybody that is interested in plyometrics, RSI, but for sure, uh, youth sports and, and youth sports development is something I'm just extremely passionate about because there is a right and wrong way to do it. And so I feel like we should all support each other when it comes to kids. Like it's one thing with, you know, Zach hitting up, you know, the women's basketball strength coach for Tennessee. That there's going to be a, a line that you draw about how much you're willing to share with each other if you, you know, if you play each other, you know, in a couple of weeks. But like when it comes to kids, man, like let's let's really do this the right way and, and give them the best that they deserve. So that's awesome, man. Yep. Um, Richard, thank you, Timothy. We appreciate you. Thank you. We appreciate everything you've done for the show appreciate too, it. as sure. well. I don't want us to end without mentioning that. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you guys, man. Y'all are breath of fresh air too with just this podcast. I think you guys are doing a phenomenal job with, um, uh, real conversations. I mean, real is like an understatement in terms of like, uh, when you flip this thing on, I think people know that they're going to hear exactly what's on people's minds and hearts without really being kind of political about anything or just like, you know, walking on eggshells. It's, it's what our profession needs. It's just honest conversation. So yeah, I appreciate you guys creating an environment for that to happen. Hell yeah. Thank we you, appreciate man. it. Without you, this thing would be dead. Yeah. Dying really on would. the vine for sure. Happy so we appreciate you, guys, you a lot. Uh, everybody, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you've made it this far, please like, subscribe, tell a friend, uh, go check out Plyomat, and we'll see you next time.